hello everyone and welcome to my basement lair again finally have something up on the bench and you'll be real excited like I am behold that is a toaster <laughs> I'm busy outfitting my uh, kitchen with appropriate period appliances this isn't mid to late 30s like the house is this is actually a late 40s uh, Toastmaster brand I should say, yeah, it's a Toastmaster brand toaster that I picked up for less than $20. Uh, I just, it has the general aesthetic that I'm going for. My uh, plan is to make the kitchen be a 40s, 50s style. You know, you see the General Electric ads or the Westinghouse ads for the Dream Kitchen or whatever. I'm using aesthetic choices from those to put mine together, and so I'm also grabbing appliances to fit that narrative. And I am going to use them. I mean, I, I, I have a 1955 General Electric Skyliner stove that is absolutely gorgeous and works just fine. And I have a refrigerator that will be going in there eventually that I'll get to look at when I have the time to move it down here. But for starters, I just had this. I was already looking at it. And I decided, well, what the heck? You know, I haven't actually tried using the thing. Might as well pop it open and see what's going on in there. Because I want to know how the mechanism works. So, just so I have something for the title, what model is this? Okay, so this is a Toastman that operates on other IC or DC. Uh, okay. It's made by the McGraw Electric Company and is a model 1B9. We've got the crumb tray under here, so I should be able to, yeah, pop that open. And interesting, is that... Okay, for uh, for some reason I always had this idea in my head that I need to have a toaster with a little chime in it. I was kind of hoping this would have some sort of a some sort of something that when it reaches the top, you know, it goes ding or something along those lines. Uh, insulation on that wire there looks pretty good. I think it's using mica sheets for the wire, and I get the distinct feeling that if this wire has still got good continuity, which no reason to expect that it doesn't, it's going to reek when it actually warms up. That uh, cord's actually in pretty good condition. So there's tension adjustment points in there. Is this for, let me see. So I push down on the, the paddle. Is that actually, uh, yeah, I believe it is. I can't quite do it here, but I believe that is the spring for the lift control. Now there's supposed to be a set of screws in the bottom of this thing holding the two hives together. Those are gone when I got it. But it's pretty easy to take it apart. There are only two controls on front. We have the actual... I should show this better. Is it actually in frame? Yeah, it is. Got my paddle here, which now does not want to... Okay, yeah, it takes a lot of effort to get that to actually go down. And then, I don't know if you can hear it, but... Oh. It's got a mechanical timer in there for uh, determining when it actually pops up. And I am very curious about seeing all of that in operation. So I'm going to start by removing the timer control knob at the front here. It's just labeled lighter and darker. Uh, stamped into the steel right here, and this knob just has a single small brass machine screw coming out of the front and going into the knob, although there are a pair of very small molded detents on the back of this guy that mesh into this brass uh, threaded collar here, so that uh, keeps it oriented. You can see the missing screws are not really helping there. And the knob on the front here just has a large set screw, not unlike most 20s and 30s radios. So that just comes right off there. Pretty easy. I should be able to rock the back end. Oh, up. I have had this part once already, and it hangs up every time at the back here. It needs a, a bit of help. Where 
exactly am I hanging up? So I want to make sure that I keep it to that slot. There we go. All right. So I got the housing off. We're just gonna set that aside. I'll polish that up later. So there is the like the insulators on either side. See down in there, we've got our heating coil assemblies. And there's little tags on the inside that say 2.39 amp. Okay, so this thing does use a not insignificant, excuse me, not insignificant amount of power. And I can't tell because each, each side has its own plaque, so it's possible that when this thing's in operation, it might draw five. God, I hope not. That's that's a considerable amount of juice. But regardless of that, here is the mechanism that in front of you. It's our plunger control. And on the right, on the left here, we actually have this is our electrical. Our ah, this ah. Oh, these are our electrical contacts, English, for completing the circuit to the heating elements. A um, little crusty mic on this one's going to... It's still okay. I'm going to have to clean that up. But we'll see if they're still touching. And then this whole contraption right here is our timer mechanism. And you can just see on the right side here what appears to be a clock style mainspring, or at least I'm pretty, yeah, that, that's a mainspring. So a mechanical timer. So when we actually operate this thing, so if I get enough force, let's, let's set this over to the maximum darkness setting. Shove this all the way down to the bottom. So two things have happened, our contacts have engaged. This section is now able to freely, freely slide up and down. But when it presses down all the way and the mechanism isn't actually going because it looks like it's stuck, I'm gonna have to open this up and clean it. Once it goes down all the way, this little arm right here, it's got a roller on it. That arm drops into place and is holding the bottom section of the uh, mechanism down, holding it in place. Now a little further in, I don't have a flashlight here to make this a little more obvious, there's a uh, this bar on the inside with a series of teeth connected at the top with this gear. Now if I turn this up a little bit and get the timer to start ticking away. Okay, the gear is rotating. This is now pulling, or it was, actively pulling the arm here up, not the whole assembly, just this freely floating arm, which is resting on that uh, on that serrated bar right there. Now, as we allow the mechanism to keep going, come on. What's going to happen is there's a sloping surface right here. That's going to come up, contact this little roller right here, and push the entire arm out. And once it gets all the way to the top, or I should say, once this gets all the way to the bottom of its uh, travel, and this arm is all the way as far out as it can be, this little holder here at the bottom is going to scoot out of the way, and the, whole, the uh, spring will then force the entire mechanism back up to the top. And it would happen if the timer would play ball with me. Come on. It's probably a lot of old old grease in there. Come on. Don't make me look stupid. Just turn it up to maximum lightness. Just starting to touch the roller there. And 
All right, there we go. Now, this still has quite a bit of motion where it can move up before it expends all of its energy. But what I want to do is get that out of there. And from the look of things, all I should have to do is remove these two screws, which are capturing the top of this. So let me see if I can't get those out. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that just like on uh, modern toasters where you can, you know, eject it early, because this arm assembly here, once it's down, freely floats up and down, once you push it up far enough, it'll hit the roller and eject the whole thing and shut it off. So you're not, once you press it down, you're not stuck with it running. You don't have to unplug the, unplug the thing if you don't want to keep making toast. So we're at least considering the end user when they built these. Very, very short screws. It's our bracket, and this uh, feels like it's captured at the bottom. Okay. So what else could be holding it? Looks like we need to go to the bottom here. And we probably need to take out uh, the crumb tray. Let's just start removing every single fastener in the thing and see if that gets us where we want to be. Hmm? Okay, so there's the crumb tray out of the way. Looks like there might be some corrosion on some of these parts before I even try to make food in it. I should probably get rid of all of that. Okay, so the mechanism's bottom is this little sheet metal housing right here. Hmm. Should be able to then lift. Okay, the cord is attached to that, so I don't want to maneuver that too much. I can't quite tell how that is being attached there. Unless this does this come off? I'm gonna wager that's no. Doesn't feel like it. Hmm. No, it does not feel like it wants to come off. Well, damn. That kind of kills that whole idea. Well, what can I do? Well, if I can't get that off immediately, let's move over to the main part of the mechanism. Since it's a little bit difficult to get the thing to drop, we should try removing this, because it also has screws and brackets, so... Ruin those if I use something that tiny. Let's see. There we are. These appear to be the same thread and length as the ones holding the top of the timer. Um, wait a minute. This tin edge here on the timer doesn't... It wraps all the way around it. But it appears to be very loosely held here. Yeah, I can uh, very gently, at least on that side, pry the bottom off of these pins, possibly. Well, maybe not so easily. This stuff is very thin, very flimsy, and I may damage it just trying to get in there that way, so we'll hold off on that. So that allows this to flex, but I want to get this assembly off here because these shafts have a little bit of rust on them, so there appear to be not quite eclipse on there, but something fairly close to them. This one has been pretty well mangled. How does someone manage to do that? Hmm. Normally, what I would do is set something like that there, and now because I've loosened the rest of the mechanism off of there, now it's going to be really tricky. So I need to have leverage behind that. So let's. Hmm. 
don't want to do that. I don't have a vise set up, so I can't really clamp any of this in place. Let's see about... I can use the top of that post to our advantage any. Nah, sort of. I got it to move a little bit. Nah, it doesn't really want to go anywhere. Let's see if we can't get it to move a little more. Yeah. I may wind up replacing these with slightly more modern Eclipse. Because these are very, very heavy duty. that one. This one, however, someone has managed to pretty well screw up the relation between those two forked ends. Of course it wants to move, so I can't really just put them back into position. I knock some sense into the timer. Not much better than that. <clears throat> okay, well, eh, there it goes. Hooray! The whole thing just explodes. That makes it easy, right? This comes out. We do actually have a little pair of well, we have four rollers on this. I don't know if you can see that. This thing has not moved in so long that the edges of this are actually worn flat in places. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. These, however, are riveted in place, so I'll just have to soak them in a solvent of some kind uh, to get them loosened up and clean all the junk out of them. So there's that. How are these held at the bottom? Is it a similar arrangement? Uh, it does appear to be. However, that doesn't matter. If we can get those. Uh, oh, that one just came right out. Hmm. Nope, that one's just captive by the top and bottom half, so no big deal there. And now, uh, oh, that just kind of falls off of that. And then it appears, from the cutouts in the front, that if I get it low enough, it should pull out from the front, but these two bars are blocking it from doing so. So let's see what we have to do to get those out from the bottom. Oh, and the timer mechanism is now... Oh, look at that. Ta-da! It's free! And it's covered in crumbs. Cool. Oh, there's a little... I really want to see what the escape mechanism on this thing is, so we'll take that apart in a minute. But I want to get this as far apart as I can to be able to clean it out because there's a lot of crumbs and junk in here and it's just kind of gross. So I'll flip this over and yes, there are a pair of the exact same style clips on the bottom end. Uh, get the big light section far away from the rest of the unit. There we go. So yeah, we got one there and one there. They are a little messed up, looks like. But not impossible to remove. Just not all that fun to remove. Alright, let's 
one. Clean that up. Take it to work, put it on the lathe, just for some extra overkill. <laughs> I'm sure it's some polish and compound that should clean right up okay. So yeah, that, that just kind of held in place. Actually, let me take the tension off of the mechanism here. So that's the main spring for lifting and everything. Oh, interesting. This appears to be um, basically a sh uh, not really not so much a shock absorber, but a um, oh a, a damper really. The uh, the walls of it are made out of brass. And the piston is also made out of brass, and they're not you know it's not a press fit. It's you know maybe. A, Mm, few th more than a few thousands, but it's it's just enough so that as it's trying to push down on it, it's as the air is being squeezed into this tight chamber and is trying to push past the uh, thin edges of the piston, and so it slows the whole mechanism down. Uh, I want to say on the early uh, some of the early very early machine guns, Browning and otherwise, Maxim, I think was called the Fusee, a uh, similar system uh, that, all, that effectively adjusted the fire rate. Uh, I think the French actually used one that had a hydraulic piston system. By the way, getting off topic there. Uh, okay, interesting. The power cord is actually just attached right here at the back with a pair of large wire nuts. So that makes replacement pretty easy. But again, uh, I'll check with a voltmeter, but the insulation still appears to be in good shape. And it's not going anywhere now. Can we disconnect the uh, fusee from this? Um, hmm. That awkward bend at the end of it is making it a little difficult. Oh, how is it held at the front? It looks like it just clips in place. I'm going to try gently prying up on it with the screwdriver. There we go. Yep. You can just hear that little bit of suction at the end there. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's neat. Very clever engineering. All right, and there's the end of the fusee there, and now we have exposed our last little e-clip. These things are pretty thick. I'm sure I can find equivalents. Because I don't feel like putting these damn things back. Destroying this one, that's uh, perfectly okay. So yeah, just get rid of these crappy horseshoe deals. All right, that's the second one out of the way, which means I flip her back over. Now we should be able to extract the risers or the tray or whatever the heck this is actually called. So that one's lined up over there. That one is lined up over there. And why is it not? Oh, almost got it. Keeping track of the order operations, because I sure as hell isn't. Aren't. Interesting. So I was curious about how the electrical connection to this thing is made. Um, gosh. Uh, so there are a pair of sleeves on this. Those are brass. Those are not insulated. So this is our electrical connector here. Oh, wait a minute. Am I thinking about this the wrong way? No, this isn't electrified. It's a shorting strip. Yeah, okay. Uh, for a second, I thought this thing was actually becoming part of the circuit, which means that the toaster is briefly connected to the, to the, the line like a... Um, an all-American 5 hot chassis radio. No, that is not the case at all. Hopefully. 
Now the lever here is pinned in place at the back of the cotter key. However, I, it's not hurting anything and I'm not gonna worry about it. And we've also got these hangers in here. Those are kind of crusty looking. And then we have whatever the hell that is. I don't know. What is that for anyway? Is that for the crumb tray? No. Weird. But it looks kind of gross, so let's take that out of there so I can clean it. At most, I'll probably wind up making waffles in this. Not, not really big on toast. So that's steel strip with uh, some riveted bits on it. Couldn't tell you. Oh. That's... Okay, that's interesting. I was thinking it was some sort of a bimetallic strip, because it's got a bluish sheen to it. Uh, kind of reminds you of the stuff you see in the automatic chokes on a carburetor of an old car. I know there's this other piece of metal right here with an L that appears to have an adjustable stop. So it's kind of hard to see this piece down here, and then it comes down to a little bumper, and there's a nut on the back end of it. And it looks like, I'll bet when this warms up, that arm comes over and contacts this? Now is that connected to anything? Hmm. Not really, no, it's just connected between two parts of the same assembly. Weird. I have no clue what that's even for. I won't worry about it. Not important. Uh, okay, now what? Well, we could take these slat things out. Oh, oh, wait a minute, no. Those are actually holding up... Are those holding up the mica? Or are they just sitting there? No, they're just sitting there. I think... Can I just, uh, like, lift these out? It looks all the world like I should be able to. If I lift one... And pull it over this way... And then down... Hmm. Right, well, I got one out, but I'm not too sure about that. Hmm. Yeah, see, and I bent this tab in the process of pulling up on it. I don't really care for that. Hmm. That's just how they put them in originally. It's just those are the guides for where the food is going to be, so I kind of like them not to be covered in rust. So uh, rust is not particularly tasty. Okay, so that's that's pretty much all of the major components. We have the tray, got the mechanism here, the guide rods, the lever, and the uh, damper assembly, fusey, whatever you want to call it. But I want to know what's inside of this. Because that's, that's uh, just really, really neat. I'm sure it's nothing terribly exciting, but we can still take a look. Okay, so I'm sacrificing a fair amount of acetone here, and I'm just going to, instead of trying to take the thing apart, which it looks like is not going to be too possible, because the only way to do so is to knock the pin out of this gear, which is the opposite side of the mainspring. Otherwise, I'd have to take the mainspring apart, and we're not doing that. So I'm just going to allow this whole thing to baste in this and hopefully remove all the old oils, or at least break it down, and then I can, I can clean it, scrub it, and whatever, and just generally try to get it cleaner. Well, I plan on moving on to something different once I had this little guy in the bath, but I took it out after a little bit, and it's running a little bit better but it's still a little sluggish on the maximum darkness setting. 
which is kind of unfortunate. So that's going to show you my wind up spring here. Like that. Okay. This, as it turns out, is sort of a break. So when it's down here, the mechanism is prevented from really having any way to unload itself. If I lift that, then our little friend starts to run. The problem is he starts to stick every so often. Of course, if I crank this up to maximum lightness, that's yeah, a little better. But it's not great. I'm thinking the only real way I'm going to be able to really make this better is by actually taking one of these plates off and cleaning the, uh, the ends of each of these little gear assemblies. Because just, just soaking it in this massotone probably isn't going to really get it out of all the crevices. Since there's no bearing material or anything, there's nothing really there for it to wear against except the actual frame. So it's probably um, stamped steel against brass. I'm just trying to get the rest of the energy out of this thing before I Try taking it apart again. What I don't know is if I take these nuts off the end there, if this will actually go anywhere, or if the rain spring will try to take off into low Earth orbit. It's just very hesitant to uh, to actually do anything. So. It'd be stupid, take these nuts off again, and because everything else under here isn't really under uh, spring tension. Okay, so when I last left off, I believe I was looking at the uh, timer mechanism here. Uh, since that last bit. I have actually gone and cleaned this up quite a bit, put some white lithium grease in the uh, ends of the shafts there, and now it is running much, much nicer. So that's all well and good. Timer mechanism is functioning. However, I started looking at the insides of the thing more and more, and I realized it really just needs to be cleaned up, like the whole thing. The heater elements are looking a little tired, and there was evidence of rust and just leftover crumbs that got baked into the mechanism and all that, so I took the whole thing apart. So, here is the shell assembly. Here is the base that the shell goes onto, holds everything. The outside of the toaster is elsewhere. And then we have the, uh, the arms here that actually lift the bottom of the bread up along with the contact. All of this got thrown in a, uh, a rust removing bath and cleaned. So that's, it's removed a lot of the gunk. Did what I could to try and lubricate the wheels on the lifter here so that moves nicely. Piston in its little cup here. So all the parts are set aside. And the big problem I had when I was taking this apart was the electricals. So the heater elements and toasters are typically a sheet of mica with uh, nickel chromium or uh, nichrome wire wrapped around them. Uh, unfortunately these mica sheets are starting to disintegrate pretty badly. Now a few of these aren't so bad but if you'll notice how these uh, wires are starting to sag, the edges are pulling away and breaking and they're starting to get too close to each other and make contact. And in fact, this one right here was the one that really screwed everything up. The uh, tab broke off, and now the wire is floating out in space. So it's continuity, but it's a bit of a liability. And they're just, um, yeah, they're no good. They are so flimsy. 
So that was... I, I can't put them back in. They're just not in good enough shape. I can't put them back in. So we became, well, do I find another model to cannibalize? Or maybe does someone out there uh, sell reproductions? Simple answer is no. You can't buy reproduction heating elements for the, the Toastmaster. It looks like there's uh, maybe some elements available for one model of Sunbeam that like it was super popular over in Britain or something. Because the British... Uh, seem to make a lot of reproduction stuff. However, I did get very lucky in that the Toastmaster brand must have been bought by somebody else or continued on for a very long time until recently because on eBay I found these. These elements are for a fairly modern toaster and these are actually dated for 2019. And uh, they're 120 volt. Uh, they're rated a little less on current draw. These are 235 watt panes. I forget what these are. Either way, and I looked at them and said, you know, for 12 bucks, eh, not too bad. I, I, you know, I was supposedly going to get uh, two of them per package. Must have been an issue with the eBay label because in, instead of getting four, I only got two. I thought there were two per lot, so I had to find another company that sold them. And uh, apparently their website was screwed up too because I ordered two more of these and instead I got two packs of 12. I, I swear to God I read the fine print. I don't know what the hell happened. Either way, I have these elements. And the nice thing is, dimensionally, they will sit right in place of the originals, which is great. And they have the bus bar at the top to join the segments. And at the bottom, they have a pair of contact points. Now, these right here are where our, uh, I think these are brass bus bars, would go between each of the elements and get screwed together. Like that. And, of course, these don't have holes in those positions. In fact, they have these little right angle tab things. So my solution is going to be to, to uh, I don't know, cut a lot... I think I might just fold this over. I'll fold this over and crimp it in place so it's tight. And there's enough metal there that I can line these up and I can drill a pair of holes clean through these plated bars to make new screw positions. And then I'll be able to drop those in to this. But before I do that, I need to get the superstructure put back together because these have to go in once this assembly is, you know, back together. So these will these will sit up in here, kind of like that. So that's exciting. Get these out of the way and set uh, these old elements over to the side. Yeah, so when this thing is on, the amount of power it's using, it, it draws 10 amps for a toaster. And then I've never actually checked with modern toasters used, but for, to me that just seems pretty damn high. I was kind of impressed since your average outlet circuit in a home is mm, 20 on average. If they actually do it right and use uh, either 14 or 12 gauge, or no, I'm sorry, not 14, 12 or 10 gauge wire. Uh, okay, so I have base here, got this guy. And now I just got to remember all the orientations. So lifter mechanism needs to go this way. And this just attaches to the base here with four tabs at the bottom of it that get twisted to lock it in place. Not unlike uh, can capacitors in, in uh, electrical equipment. Assuming I can ah, get it to go back in there without injuring myself. And then we need to get these to line back up. Oops. Okay. So there's that. Flip this back over and these four tabs here have to get twisted. Before I do that though, let me take one of these and just confirm that we're not going to have any fitment issues. If I drop this into there and... oh, no. Even with the uh, the feet that are in there, there should be no trouble. In fact, it looks like these little hooks at the bottom are meant to hold it. Okay, so that's 
That's perfect. Alright, so I'll set that aside. Here it requires. Crossing my fingers that in the process of putting these back in, the tabs don't just shear clean off, because that would be a real, real kick in the nuts for them to just fail on me now. And they don't need much. Just a little twist. There. And that will keep that from going anywhere. Okay. Now I gotta remember. <laughs> I don't have the luxury of looking back at my video right now to see how all this came apart. But I believe. Let's see, we need to put the lifter assembly in before or after the elements. No, the elements have to go in before all of this junk. However, one thing I believe I can technically put back in is this guy. So this is a bimetallic strip. I don't remember if I covered it in my previous segment. Uh, but the timer mechanism has this extra lever back here on the side that when lifted makes the mechanism run faster than normal. I wonder what the heck that was for. Well, it turns out that gets pressed on by this bimetallic strip when the toaster reaches normal operating temperature. Now there is a stop, this guy right here that's adjustable, uh, that this will rest against. But this sits up here just behind the timer, and if I could get it oriented correctly. Yeah, I just, whoops. Right. sits up here like this, and this little lever right here will eventually lift that outwards. Or it'll, uh, let's see, which way does it go? So in order for that to work, hmm, it's one of those things that I really like to actually see it in operation. Yeah. So this arm will get pulled backwards, so the bimetallic strip will try to move that way, and it'll pull on this. That way, when the toaster is actually already warmed up, if you used it, and the elements don't have to take quite as long to get hot, it won't burn your toast if you set it for light, but the toaster's already warmed up, and it just uh, completely nukes whatever you've got in there. It's a, it's a neat idea. However, I don't know, can I put this back yet? Mmm, you know what, no, I'm gonna have to leave that for last, so I need to deal with the elements. So I need to get them prepped for installation. So let's set the body aside. And we need to bring our friends over here. Now what I'm thinking is, if I just bend these over, I shouldn't have any trouble getting them in. So let's just try that first. And if I damage one, don't worry, I have like two dozen extras because... Yeah. Reasons. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with an extra two dozen heater elements. Maybe make a teeny tiny oven for annealing cartridge brass. Okay, so that one's bent over. I want to make sure this isn't going to take up any additional space because this is going to sit in here. Wow, that just barely clears. I don't know if you can see this, but there are four small pointing device uh, forks. That one there, that one there, there, and there that are holding this thing up. Now, hmm, that one and that one are directly up against... <laughs> directly up against these contact points. On the old elements, they're just these two little... Um, two little holes with grommets in them, or um, brass... Scooches? I don't know what the hell they call them. They're... they're, they're uh, sorry, they're brass rivets, actually. They're open... open brass... Uh, pop rivets, basically. These, however, are very, very close to the chassis edges, and if this was to shift and touch one of them, it would electrify the housing of the toaster, which would not be good. 
what are we going to do to mitigate that possibility? Now the center bar at the end there, the bottom one in the middle, doesn't connect to anything, it's just there to hold the whole thing together. So that's... that's fine. Hmm... I may want to cut those off. I don't know if I can... if I can really risk... that kind of a, uh... oopsie. The only other option would be to bend those tabs down and out of the way. I mean, which I, which I, I could reasonably do, but... Eh. Just want to make this safe. I don't need to electrocute myself while I'm trying to make breakfast. Hmm. Yeah, the easiest thing to do is just going to be to bend down the, uh, bend those little tabs down so that they're no longer in the way. Considering this is all a steel stamping, it's not, shouldn't be a very difficult thing to do. There. So now, it's just the center two that are holding that up. Those are away from our possible points of contact, and once I've got these ready, I think I will make it extra special safe and we will throw on a little bit of uh, insulating varnish. This stuff's good for like a thousand volts. I put it in a starter motor. So that is the plan. Now it's interesting that only the outer two elements actually have these little fingers. The inner ones don't. So what exactly do these just kind of sit in there? Whoops. So at the top, it's going to sit against a pair of uh, pieces of metal that stick out there. And here... Hmm. There's not a lot for it to, uh, to rest against. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, now of course the other main thing we need to deal with is the positioning of these holes. The bus bars... Try and get this as square at the bottom as I can. The bus bars have to go... If we line this up... And I need a writing implement. Uh, okay, everybody, I think this video's dragged on for just a little bit too long. I just looked at the uh, timestamp on things. So I'm going to end this one by uh, showing off a little what I've figured out. Now, last I looked at it, I was planning on drilling some holes and getting things set up. My idea of bending over the tabs here on the ends uh, turned out not to be that great of an idea because the amount of metal that is folded over is very close to the bottom anyway, even with the spacing it's at, and even worse, as it turns out, I completely negate, uh, forgot about the lifter arm here coming very, very close to this one contact right here. So, because I have a whole bunch of these extra elements, my new solution is, uh, well, A, I went to the hardware store and I bought myself a proper Dremel tool. I don't have one. And I just cut the ears clean off of these. It can be cleaned up a little bit with the, uh, the grinder edge to get the roughness out. But these are going to be nice and flush, and then I will drill the new holes similar to how I've done on these. You can see I've got the, the brass nuts on that side, and these have been attached right there. Probably want to put washers on those, though, keep the microfilm being damaged. So that's the plan. I'll have these guys drilled and ready to install, and then I should be able to wrap up assembly in the next video. Uh, thanks for watching.